Hello, Bobcats. Welcome class of 2024. Welcome to your convocation. This convocation is unconventional compared to convocations of the past, but that's what this year is, unconventional. I really believe that this unconventional year is going to bring new opportunities that students haven't seen in the past. Times like these call for innovation, adaptability, and creativity. I truly believe that this incoming class is going to gain so many valuable skills that will prepare you to be the leaders of the future. Before I go any further, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Mike Vasquez and I'm your ASMSU student body president. As president, it is my goal to make MSU home for you. And to me, home means a place you can feel com comfortable in. Home is a place where you can thrive. Home is somewhere that you can always look forward to coming back to. When I came to Montana State, it didn't feel like home. I was uncomfortable and out of place. I was overwhelmed. I can't even imagine what it's like being a freshman coming to campus during this pandemic. What got me through my freshman year were the people, the friends that I made in my residence halls, the professors and advisors who helped me navigate classes, and the RAs who are able to always provide support. There are so many people willing and able to help you through this unprecedented time. And if you ever want to come talk to me, my door is open. The ASMSU office is located in the sub, and I can't emphasize this enough, my door is always open. I would love to help you navigate this time. Once I did find my place here, I wanted to get more involved. I wanted to pass along my experience to the next freshman class. I wanted to help them find their place at MSU. So I applied to be an RA. This experience was incredible because it connected me to hundreds of people across campus. I was able to build my leadership skills and my confidence. I was able to connect my residents to resources, clubs, and each other. I really loved making MSU home for the students in my hall, but I wanted to take it to the next step. So that's when I decided to run for student body president and make MSU home for all students. My advice to you, create your own experiences that you will enjoy and remember. Find your group on campus that makes you comfortable and find those people on campus that will push you to new heights. Go to your professor's office hours. They are a wealth of knowledge and will help you on your path. I could go on and on, but the biggest piece of advice that I could give is to have the courage to do new things. In high school, I rarely did this because I was afraid of rejection. Because of this, I missed out on new friends, cool classes, visiting interesting places, and more. But because of the friends I made at MSU, I was pushed to try new things. They pushed me to ski more, they pushed me to apply to be an RA, and they pushed me to run for president. All of these experiences have really shaped my college career. There are so many clubs and organizations on campus that are waiting for you to leave your mark. Don't be afraid to try a few of them out. Thank you for coming to campus and trusting the university. I believe that this year will be challenging but rewarding. And before I introduce our president, I want to emphasize two things. Find your place on campus and ask for help. There are so many people who are willing to help you. At Montana State University, we are blessed with some of the best leadership in this world. Our president has done a fantastic job navigating this university through the pandemic. She knows how to get stuff done and knows how to motivate others. It is my great honor to introduce the president of your university, President Wadad Cruzado. Thank you, dear ASMSU president, Michael Vasquez. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your university, Montana State, and to our MSU convocation. It is a pleasure to have you with us virtually tonight. As we set our intentions for being here together, we reflect on the layered history of this land. We acknowledge that we are on indigenous lands and we recognize the first peoples and nations who historically resided in this area that now for 127 years has been home to Montana State University. So perhaps many of you have wondered, what exactly is a convocation? Well, if vocation is a calling, convocation means calling people together. In this case, convocation means that we are all called to mark the start of the academic journey of the MSU class of 2024 at this proud house of blue and gold. At each convocation, it is our custom to welcome our incoming freshman class with a notable speaker. This year, 
it is our extreme honor that our renowned speaker is an MSU alumna who is recognized nationally as an author, social commentator, the voice of Violet in The Incredibles animated films, and so much more. Many of you by now have read Sarah Vowell's wonderful book, Lafayette in the Somewhat United States, which is our chosen book for convocation. Or you may recognize Sarah from her insightful pieces in the New York Times, where she is a contributing opinion writer. Recently, Sarah has written about a topic that is very dear to our hearts, the importance of land-grant universities, of which Montana State is proudly one. Her opinion piece, published earlier this month in the New York Times, explores the prominent role of graduates from public universities as they have become national leaders. There is another story that compels us tonight, and that is Sarah's own story. Certainly, many of us can see or would love to see ourselves in Sarah's journey. Sarah Val graduated from MSU in 1993, our centennial year with a degree in modern languages and literatures. Both of her parents worked at Montana State University while Sarah was growing up in Bozeman. While a student at MSU, Sarah helped support herself by working at the Pickle Barrel, the beloved sandwich shop on College Street that has provided a part-time job and reliable, delicious food to many Bobcats. In addition, Sarah was a disc jockey at KGLT, a station also based on our campus, and this experience ignited her passion for radio. Her first book, Radio On, published in 1995, was based on her year-long diary of working at and listening to the radio. From 1996 to 2006, Sarah was a contributing editor to National Public Radio's This American Life. Sarah has gone on to write seven nonfiction books on American history and culture, becoming a New York Times best-selling author along the way. Her wit and intelligence, as well as her irony and sarcasm in discussing current affairs has made Sarah a favorite on late night television. And as I mentioned, many of you will recognize her voice instantly as that of superhero Violet Parr, in the Academy Award-winning The Incredibles and its sequel, Incredibles 2, both from Pixar Animation Studios. I will remind our audience and our wonderful class of 2024 that Violet Parr was born with the superhuman ability to render herself invisible as well as to generate force fields. Sounds familiar? Ladies and gentlemen, my dear class of 2024, on behalf of the students, faculty and staff of Montana State University, it is indeed an honor to welcome tonight's speaker, Sarah Fowl. Thank you, President Cruzado. Hello, students. Hello, neighbors. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. Um, before I um, give a little speech for a second, I thought I would explain uh, for those of you who aren't uh, first year students at MSU this year that the students have been assigned this book that I wrote called Lafayette in the Somewhat United States and the book is more or less about the Revolutionary War. A few years ago I visited Nepal. I went with my sister Amy who like me graduated from MSU and her son Owen who is currently a student here. There is a natural affinity between the inhabitants of the Rockies and the people of the Himalayas. There is, for instance, a community of resettled Tibetans in Utah. To those of you who are new to Bozeman, if you walk around town, you will see and sometimes hear a number of Himalayan prayer flags, souvenirs from treks and climbs hanging from the houses and fluttering in the wind. In Nepal, we toured the World Heritage sites of the Kathmandu Valley with a local guide, Sendesh. After a few days with us, Sendesh blurted out that he found my sister and me puzzling. 
Our questions about Hindu poetry and Buddhist architecture spoke to a certain level of education. And yet, based on our stories about growing up in Montana and our family in Oklahoma, he had concluded that we are, his word, peasants. And he wanted to know how American peasants would even know about Nepal, much less travel there, and use terminology like the historical Buddha. Sandesh, I replied, have you ever heard of Abraham Lincoln? He had, but he had not heard of the Morrill Act of 1862. So in a cafe in Kathmandu, we proceeded to tell him about America's land grant colleges like this one that President Lincoln signed into law, how the federal government donated land to the states to fund public universities, and how for the first time in the history of the world, the children of farm and factory workers and others in the working classes, we peasants, were deemed collectively worthy of publicly supported higher education. Now, take a second to savor that piece of cake, because here we have arrived at the abyss of American history. And the only truthful way to approach our history is what I call cake versus caveats. For every hard-won milestone of justice or fairness or majesty, reasons to bake a celebratory cake, there are going to be multiple caveats that will make us lose our appetites. And to pretend otherwise is make-believe. But to discuss only the caveats without the occasional bite of cake is just as false. So let's we peasants pat ourselves on the back about our world historical access to book learning and then pause to think about who that land in land grant originally belonged to and all the dastardly ways the US government acquired it. A few weeks before the Morrill Act became law, Lincoln also signed the Homestead Act, which transformed this region. Homesteader Eleanor Pruitt Stewart, a widow who set out from Denver with her young daughter to prove up her own ranch in Wyoming, wrote her old boss in the city, you'd think I wanted you to homestead, wouldn't you? But I am only thinking of the troops of tired, worried women, sometimes even cold and hungry, scared to death of losing their places to work, who could have plenty to eat, who could have good fires by gathering the wood and, comforting, and comfortable homes of their own if they but had courage and determination to get them. I admire Eleanor and I'm happy for her hard-earned warmth. At the same time, who was gathering wood and making good fires on what became her land for the preceding eons? I looked it up. It was the Shoshone and sometimes the Utes. And wrestling with this country, if you're having only one thought, that is never enough thoughts. American history is not a road, it's an ecosystem. It's everything between mountains and a microbe, and it can be as promising as the spring thaw or as cruel as the food chain, usually simultaneously. Now in this book of mine about the American Revolution, which you have been assigned, and I'm sure you've read every page, George Washington comes up. He can be problematic, but not only problematic. Three years ago this month, hordes of white supremacists, Confederate and Nazi sympathizers, and the KKK assembled in Charlottesville, Virginia for a deadly rally in which they chanted, the Jews will not replace us. Now, a few weeks after that rally, I was speaking at a college in Massachusetts, and I brought up George Washington's 1790 letter to the synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island, affirming the First Amendment's guarantee of religious freedom, which was brand new. He cited Hebrew scripture, everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. And this letter is worth reading. It's, it's where George Washington condemns tolerance because he says, tolerance implies there's one superior group that puts up with a, an inferior group, and we're done with that. So in that auditorium, 
I was making the innocuous point that according to our Virginian first president's letter of brotherhood to the Jews of Newport, anti-Semitism has been officially un-American for more than two centuries. A sudden loud wailing from the audience caught my attention and I stopped talking to make sure that we didn't need medical assistance. A college student was weeping melodramatically and when I asked if she was okay, she replied that she found it too painful to hear something nice being said about a slave owner. I wasn't sure what she wanted me to do, travel back in time and convince President Washington to urge the Congress to remove the guarantee of freedom of religion from the First Amendment because the people who came up with it were far, far from perfect. Have any of you ever been to a country without freedom of religion? I have. Why do you think all those Tibetans resettled in Utah, the thriving theater scene? Tibetans in their homeland will spend years in Chinese prisons if they are caught merely owning a photo of their exiled spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama. Definitely question the motives and biographies of the founders and cry if you need to, preferably after I have finished speaking, but do not take for granted, to, but do not take for granted the magnitude of the Bill of Rights. Every righteous reform movement depends on it and not just our own. Where are Tibetans welcome to protest the Chinese president? Lafayette Square, across from the White House. And who started the tradition of protest there? The suffragists who camped out to yell at Woodrow Wilson. And are we celebrating them this month for the 100th anniversary of the country? And are we celebrating them this month for the 100th anniversary of countrywide female suffrage and the passage of the 19th Amendment? Kind of. We also have to talk about how white suffragists marginalized black suffragists, many of whom didn't finally get the vote until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So, cake, caveat, cake, caveat. Voting Rights Act of 1965, bake your cake. But who pressured the president and the Congress to pass that law? Nonviolent protesters who endured years of attacks by cops, dogs, and fire hoses getting thrown in jail for exercising their First Amendment right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Still, where was Martin Luther King Jr. imprisoned when he wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail? Jefferson County, Alabama, named for the author of the Declaration's phrase, all men are created equal. And when I was researching my book, I went to Jefferson's Monticello outside Charlottesville. I walked up the hill from where the slave cabin stood and took a tour of his lovely house appraising his hypocrisy. And yet, there in a corridor that he called the Indian Hall, I got caught up in his curiosity about the wonders of this continent. There he displayed the animal specimens and American Indian art and artifacts that Lewis and Clark sent him from their expedition out west to scout this American empire. Oh, you newcomers, MSU's campus is a half hour drive from the headwaters of the Missouri River and the tributaries Lewis and Clark named, the Gallatin, the Madison, and of course, the Jefferson. In the Indian Hall at Monticello, the tour guide pointed at a replica of a map painted on a buffalo hide by a Plains tribesman. It was draped brown and earthy over a crisp white railing. The guide noted that its scrawled lines traced the stretch of country between the Missouri and Yellowstone rivers. And I teared up when he said that. It was Montana. It was home. Thank you so much, Sarah. For the final part of your convocation, President Cruzado will be interviewing Sarah Val with questions that were submitted by MSU and the Bozeman community. Thank you to all of you that submitted questions. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sarah. Oh. That was an amazing message for our students. And uh, your story about the peasant 
<laughs> being a peasant. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the most dramatic ways to illustrate to our students and our communities the transformational power of the land-grant university and to think that that same miracle still happens in our classrooms and our labs and our fields each and every day. Sarah, uh, in preparation for tonight, we asked our students if they would submit questions for you so that I can just ask those questions to you. So if that's okay? Sure. Let's go ahead and take it away. Okay. Okay. So the first question is, how did attending MSU affect your life? Do you think you could be where you are today without that education? Is that question from a student or is that from you? No, it's, <laughs> it's from a student. Oh, um, no, I mean, it was pretty fundamental to my life. Um, I mean, for one thing, I went into journalism and I first started writing at the Exponent newspaper at MSU and I was also working at KGLT. KGLT used to do a newscast and I was a newscaster, so that, that was my start in journalism. Um, but then, I mean, honestly, I mean, you introduced me talking about my job at the Pickle Barrel. I would say that job had as much bearing on any success in journalism because I, I'm not a shy person, but I'm reserved. And, when, and, you know, I don't know if you've been in the Pickle Barrel, it's very geographically small and, and, and just being thrown in that very tight space with those um, other people, which sounds like a dream right now, right? But um, <laughs> that I had to talk to them and I had to talk to customers. And I had to learn how to talk to people. And so that was uh, really helpful. And also, I mean, I was just that kid at MSU who had a million jobs up here. I was, um, I had a work study job at the Museum of the Rockies in the photo archive. I worked at the library. I, I was also on the art gallery committee. So I had, um, and then I, I did take classes, uh, but <laughs> you know, and, and actually like becoming a writer happened sort of in the art history department because that, that's what I thought I wanted to do for quite a while and um, writing the essay exams. And I just remember, you know, I don't know if they still have slides, whatever is the digital equivalent of a slide, you look at a slide of an artwork and the exams, you have a blue book I'm sure they still have those, right? <laughs> and you write an essay about two works of art. And I remember there was uh, an essay exam and it was, I think, two different Greek pieces from like a cup and a sculpture from different eras of Greek art. And I remember we were taking this exam and I was writing my essay and I started laughing because, I don't know, it was fun to me. And I remember everyone else in the class looking at me with daggers like, this is not supposed to be fun. <laughs> but uh, I just, I, that was my first moment where I realized, oh, I think I really like writing about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started working at the Exponent. I started work, uh, I wrote reviews of art shows because I thought I could do better than the person who was doing it. So I just walked in there and, and I did it. That's great. So right there, you have touched on some of the most important institutions at Montana State, the library, the Museum of the Rockies, and of course, the Exponent. Mm -hmm. And I was reading the other day, the Exponent was founded in 1895. So just two years after we were mm -hmm. founded as an institution, mm -hmm. our students decided, the, the, the pre-Sarah Vowles of the world, that they, they just have a, an opinion that they needed to voice. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, also when I left MSU, I got a an internship at the Smithsonian, and um, it was because of my work in the photo archive at the museum, and also because I had grown up having a lot of blue collar jobs. Uh, I think my mom marched me to the social security office at 13 and said, now you've got to get a real job. And so I cannot express to you the exquisite luxury of cataloging, you know, photographs of, about railroads after, you know, being a motel maid and uh, all the jobs I had had. So that work study <laughs> job was really important to me. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Sarah, here's yeah. another question from our students. In what way is our country different now than the country you wrote about in Lafayette and the somewhat United States? 
I would say it's not very different. I mean, part of that, that's what, what the book is partly about, why there's that uh, word somewhat United States in the title is, um, I mean, the book was originally supposed to be about Lafayette, this guy Americans just loved across the board. He was so popular, you know, when he returned to America it, as an old man, 80,000 people showed up in New York Harbor to welcome him, and the population of New York was 120,000 people. And so I just wanted to write about this person everyone agreed on. But then every aspect of the story, when he's a young boy coming to the um, volunteer with George Washington's army, or even as an old man when he came back, every step in his story with the Americans, it's he's there, he's gung ho, and it, the Americans are in the background bickering, <laughs> and the you know the whole the war, the Continental Congress and the Continental Army can never you know gel, and Washington is always about to get fired by his supposed friends, and you know every aspect of our history is defined by conflict and bickering, and and um, it's written into our our constitution and so our differences i mean one of my favorite parts of the book was writing about the continental congress and the first 5 minutes the first 5 minutes of the continental congress uh, someone says hey you guys we should open with a prayer the next thing that happens is someone's like oh no i can't <laughs> pray with these shifty quakers and then be, you know, because they're all like Quakers and Congregationalists and um, Church of England, what are they called? Anglicans, Episcopalians. And uh, so right at the beginning, even though they're all white male Anglo-Saxon Protestants, the country is already too diverse for them to get along. And luckily Sam Adams stands up and says, I'm not a bigot, mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. hear a prayer from an Episcopalian, but uh, their differences define them and they define us. And, and even though I know we beat ourselves up for our divisions and they do get ridiculous, uh, they come from our freedom. They come from our right to express it, our opinions and we do. And um, so I think we are the country they founded. We are them. Yep. And Lafayette stands there at the center in, 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 in such a contrast. Here he, here he is, a French aristocrat, yeah. right? Right in the middle of a revolution, right? That was against that old world model. Um, yeah, I but, mean, he was a very fancy aristocrat. Yeah. And he was an orphan and, and he was married into already at 19, one of the fanciest aristocratic families. But he had, and this is my highest compliment I can pay to anyone, the democratic spirit. Right. It doesn't matter his background. He right. was kind of a country boy. He wasn't from yeah. Paris or Versailles. Um, I mean, but he he just had that democratic spirit, and he you know he just, I mean, he was an abolitionist, and uh, you know they sent him to uh, negotiate with an Indian tribe and he got them on board. Like he just made everyone feel welcome and everyone loved him. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a perfect, um, idea for our students, right? He was 19 years old when he left everything. He left his wife, uh, with a baby, with his family, his, uh, his language, the comforts mm -hmm. of being in his own country. And just picture that, just doing that, right? Going to a foreign country in the middle of the war, of, of, of a war and volunteer to work, as you say, for free, mm -hmm. which is basically um, to be in war. Yeah. But you said it so well, Lafayette has always belonged to all of us. And I love his quote in one of his letters when he said, reflecting back, he said, I gave my heart to the Americans. Yeah, I mean, on the other hand, like everything I say, the opposite is true. And, you know, with the, with the Continental Army especially, they were a really ragtag bunch. <laughs> like no human resources executive on earth would put them together. Um, you know, well, like one of Washington's best generals was a Quaker or had been, and you have this French kid, and um, the, his artillery chief had been a bookseller. 
And, you know, at first, like when Washington shows up in Boston, when he takes over command of the gathered militias and he's, you know, turning them into an army, he, he, he says, like, we should all be, you know, one army. But he's writing letters like, oh, these people from Massachusetts, you know. And then by the end, they really do become kind of a family. And I think, like, that can be reflective and instructive for public university students, too. I mean, I feel like public universities, along with the US military, they're the only institutions in our country where a bunch of random adults are thrown together and made to coexist. Mm -hmm. And that has so much civic value in this country because we just, we don't know each other anymore. And, you know, the, the students here, they really have a chance um, to get to know all kinds of random people. And um, I mean, one of the suggestions I had for the first year seminar is they could say this simple thing to each other, tell me about your hometown. Mm -hmm. Because when you ask someone about their hometown, they'll tell you about their family, they'll tell you about the economy or the landscape. Um, and like, this is really important for us as a state and as a country, I think, because it brings people in the state closer together. And even though um, probably I know like a lot of maybe half the students are from out of state and they probably might think of Montana as this monolith, but it's the size of Japan. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are people from the reservations and the ranches and the farms. And then, you know, most of us actually do live in cities. And so <laughs> there's so much, there's so much diversity there in terms of, you know, some of your students maybe have never met an atheist. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, one of, I'm secular, but one of my best friends from MSU that I'm still really close with is a very um, devout um, person of faith. And the fact that we've known each other so long, she makes me a better writer. If I have a question about that point of view, I can just ask her. And, you know, because I'm the person who threw her incredibly terrible uh, bridal shower. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I really gave it a shot. Uh, uh, but uh, like that can be so meaningful in mm -hmm. this country where people are just so cordoned off into their own little flocks, I think. I think that's a great question for our freshman class. Tell yeah. me about your hometown. I love it. Yeah. Um, Sarah, this next question is about your craft. Mm. So this student asks, can you tell us a bit about your research and writing process? And there's another question, if I remember, that's related to this that says, how do you keep your story interesting? Oh, well, for the last one, I mean, one thing that helps, this is just a technical thing, um, and I learned this working on the radio, is whatever you write, read it aloud, because you will quickly learn in real time what needs work. Like, if you're bored, Probably your audience will be bored too. Um, <laughs> that's just, that's a really good editing trick. Cause you know, if you're reading something and you just can't wait for that to be over, take a, take a clue from that. Um, as far as research and writing, I mean, my policy is I'll learn anything from anyone. So I'll do, you know, I'll read popular histories, I'll read academic histories, I'll do archival research, but I also write a lot about historic sites, so that involves, you know, uh, I mean, my one of my policies is always ask an old timer, so wherever I go, you know, if there's some docent or tour guide or just some random, you know, elder hanging around, you can learn a lot from those people too, and I think, um, you can learn a lot by visiting mm -hmm. the sites mm -hmm. and especially to be able to put, mm -hmm. uh, put yourself there, uh, to, to have us like the best books. I mean, this is a very Montana thing to say, but I want, I want it always to have a sense of place. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that is so important. And also I think sometimes, especially writing about American history, it can get pretty grim, but I love 
the country. Like I love the physical country. I've been to all the states. I I just love going to a new. I mean, I used to when I left my house. <laughs> I loved going to a new place and you know asking, you know, t people to tell me about their hometown, basically. <laughs> but uh, so I just get gather as much information from as many different kinds of sources as I can. And then um, once I have enough of that, I mean, you could research this stuff forever, but I'll have each thought or idea or plot point or everything I need to include. And I'll, um, I'll put each of those on an index card and I'll spend a few weeks on the floor moving mm -hmm. them around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I notice in your book, right? That it has these switchbacks back and forth, past and present, and present and mm -hmm. your visits to those sites and the conversations with the actors. Because I mean, they're narrative, but I'm sometimes an idea leads to another idea that might be out of you know chronological sequence, and um, so yeah. I mean, the other thing is I want. One reason my books are really short, and I think the pieces I write for the newspaper are like this too, I like to cram in as much information into every sentence and paragraph as I can. And so that, I don't like to just waste a sentence. Mm -hmm. I want, mm -hmm. I have kind of educational purposes, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and then, I mean, the, to me, like the first draft, uh, I really hate that. But everything after that, that's where I live. I love to just hone and hone and hone. I mean, sometimes I'll do 70 drafts of something. Yeah. And that idea of never wasting a sentence, you know, it's once I was reading about filming and if, if in a good movie, if you see a nail on the wall and the actor comes and hand his hat on that nail on the wall is because there is something behind that, that it's important to the story, but there is not a second. Um, that it's superfluous, that it's missed. Yeah. Um, and yeah. When <laughs> That's funny. I think about that too, but I remember watching one of those Democratic debates last fall, and at the <laughs> very beginning, Biden coughed, and I, I was, you know, emailing my friend, if this was a movie, Biden would be dead by the end, <laughs> but life doesn't work. I mean, that's the thing, right? writing nonfiction, you have to deal with a lot of inconvenient stuff you have to squeeze in, you know. Yeah. And yet, even talking about the American Revolution in, the, in those sites, Montana intrudes in your writing in this book. Yeah, well, in this book, I was, you can tell I wanted to come home. Yes. And there was a moment actually where um, I was in the Brandywine Valley researching the Battle of Brandywine, and I, I really love uh, Andrew Wyeth and N.C. Wyeth, the painters, and they have uh, their museum there. And so I did kind of play hooky from my research to go to that museum for a minute, because when was I going to be back there? And there was this N.C. Wyeth painting at Sacagawea at Lewis and Clark, <laughs> and they're looking off at this kind of Missouri River landscape, and I, I was like, I'm I gotta go home. <laughs> Especially after spending all day driving around all these like little treed hills trying mm -hmm. to make, make sense of where this very chaotic battle happened yes. across this river. And in Montana, you yeah. would just be able to, you know, climb up on a bluff and see the whole thing. Right. But you, you couldn't do that there. But I loved it that when you least expect it in the, in the book, boom, yeah. Montana will make its presence known. So what sparked your interest in American history and inspired you to write on the topic? Um, my family history, I would say my family, um, I'm a mutt, but one of the things I am is Cherokee. I'm an en enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation and my family is from Oklahoma because Andrew Jackson decided they should live there. And so um, when I was a little kid, we every summer we would go to the Cherokee capital of Tahlequah in Oklahoma. And it would, back then they had this big amphitheater drama version of the Trail of Tears. So it was the first theater I saw was the dramatization of the Trail of Tears. And then just knowing that that was such a crucial part of our family history. And then, um, 
I, I had never intended to write about uh, American history. And when I was working on This American Life, the radio show in the 90s, my sister and I decided to make a documentary where we drove the entire um, Trail of Tears from Georgia to, um, to Oklahoma. And that changed my life. I mean, working on that story. Because I could see, just doing the research, historians aren't always the best writers, you know? <laughs> and I could see there was maybe like a way for someone who knew how to tell a clear story to talk about it. And then it was also such a great way to talk about the country because, I mean, so much of that story is, I mean, it's in the name. It's a pretty brutal, grim, everywhere we stopped was another place people died. Yes, everywhere yes. we stopped, more people were buried. But it was still a road trip. And we had barbecue, and we listened to Chuck Berry, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and um, it's such um, it's the thing about America. There, there's this writer Steve Erickson, and he says um, that the defining factors of America are annihilation and fun, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're often you know intertwined. <laughs> and so that story was just as much a, a, about the country as about that particular event. And so I think, um, and I think growing up that way, knowing it's not a pretty, uh, you know, it's not a pretty episode in American history. So I never had that thing that people my age and older used to have you know we never lost a war and we you know america is good and like there there i knew you know there were more shades of gray to the story so um that definitely what is i mean it's the defining event of my life even though it happened you know more than a hundred years before i was born i guess so you said before that you... But you can know. I say one thing? Uh -huh. And also, uh, the, Cherokee, uh, the Cherokee Nation, they were Southerners. They lived in Georgia and North Carolina and Tennessee and parts of Virginia. And they were engaged in commercial agriculture in the 19th century, which means they owned slaves and they brought their slaves on the Trail of Tears. So, like, the plot thickens, you know. Um, there's... I'm not afforded the um, luxury, let's say, of equating virtue and skin color. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. every everything is so complicated okay. in that story. So I think that, I don't know, it sort of expands your mind, I guess, to try and grapple with all of that. Okay. I mean, I'm technically allowed to join the Daughters of the Confederacy. I will not be doing that, but I'm, you know, technically I could because my Cherokee great-great-grandfather was in the Cherokee um, Volunteers of the Confederate Army because they sided, most of them sided with the Confederacy. So American history is a real thick stew for me. It is. And you said before that you like writing about ideas. And I think this student overheard you. Uh, here's the question. How have the ideas of patriotism, glory, and revolution evolved since Lafayette's time? I mean, it's happened in my lifetime because of Vietnam, I think. That changed everything in terms of how, especially how men see war and think of war and um, just because of what a nightmare that war was. And I mean, the country learned so much from that. And they also, you know, the country has learned to separate the veterans from the war. Um, we really screwed that up when those people came mm -hmm. back, I think. So it's not, I mean, it's interesting too, though, ever since I would say, um, September 11th, 2001, the country has become much more militaristic. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though there were these ideas, especially Lafayette, he was all about glory on the battlefield. It's one reason he had to leave France. They were at peace. And he came from a long line of soldiers stretching back to, you know, Joan of Arc. And he wanted battlefield glory and he needed a battle for that. But um, 
the other thing about the founding, and, and you know, it's kind of tied up with the Second Amendment too, is they were so terrified of a standing army because they saw a standing army as, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a sign of despotism, basically. So basically, that doesn't change uh, really until the 20th century. Do we change our minds about that? I mean, now we obviously have the most powerful standing army in the world. But um, that has definitely changed. And I think it was the very beginning of all that. But they were very, very wary of standing armies. And so was George Washington. I mean, he, even though the Continental Congress was a real pain in his neck, he, he definitely believed in civilian oversight. So, Sarah, the, the last two questions, which are basically one and the same, what was the most important advice you got your freshman year of college? And what advice do you have for the class of 2024? Let's see. I think they're, that freshmen get a lot more advice at this school <laughs> nowadays than when, because now don't you have something called a success counselor? Yeah, we, were, uh, we didn't have that. Um, I do remember, I mean, even before I was a freshman, we were talking before how I grew up at the, in the music department of this college taking lessons and I would sneak into classes and I was playing music with a lot of people in the faculty or the students up at the school. And, and I took lessons from, um, his name was Dan Moore. We, I took comp music composition lessons with him when I was in high school. And he told me, this is one of the best pieces of advice I ever got. He said, if you wanna be good at something, watch people who are good at something. And it doesn't matter. I mean, I was trying to become a good composer, which, spoiler alert, I think we know how that worked out. <laughs> um, but he was like, D it doesn't matter if you're watching, you know, a great musician, watch a great basketball player or a great waitress. And um, he said, you can learn more about excellence from just watching, watching people. And, he, and, and, um, it was mostly a lot of jobs, you know, and I, I've, I've taken that, you know, some of the most inspiring people in America are those um, Amtrak employees <laughs> that Joe Biden is always talking about. And, you know, the way they like the snack bar people in an Amtrak train, those are heroic people to me. They're just they're engaging with people. They're they're preparing food. They're pouring drinks. They're they're. There's also like a physical element because you're on this bumpy moving train. And so there's like this physics element to what they do and or like a nurse. I mean, they're like, <laughs> you know, scientists who have to be nice and and like watching people like that. I think you can get so much inspiration from. I mean, my advice for the students, I guess I have a few. I definitely if you're. Um, if you're qualified to get into the work study program, that was one of the best things I did. If you're new here and you're lonesome, start joining things. I mean, I, I think I have one friend still that I have 30 years later that I made in a class. All of my other friends from here that I still have they're from working at KGLT. They're from being on the art gallery committee or working at the pickle barrel. Like those people in the activities or the jobs, uh, those are the ones you get close to because, you know, you, you just have more time to relate as people. Um, I would say try to try to talk to as many people as possible. I mean, you'll find like once you, you know, leave school and, and go out into the adult world, you'll be around a lot of people like you. And that's great and all, but like here you have this opportunity to talk to all these different kinds of people, people who grew up on ranches or farms or reservations, people from other states, uh, hopefully, you know, eventually people from other countries. Um, the international students are always such a big part of these schools. And also another thing that I did I mean, I really had, it was a financial hardship and I had to save up for it and I took out a loan, but I did the study abroad program and that changed my life. It, I hadn't, you know, it just made me, I mean, I went to the, I went to the Leiden University in the Netherlands and 
I have not found, you know, my rudimentary Dutch very helpful, but just being in the world on my own, uh, that was such a, mm -hmm. that was such a big deal and traveling by myself and, um, and just being part, just leaving the country is so important for understanding our country and having that perspective and getting like you need, it's almost like a little, um, dress rehearsal for going out into the world and being away from where you're from and your family, just to have that experience is really valuable. And I mean, I have to say back to the peasants thing that I started <laughs> with, like one of the funniest things about going to Leiden University, I mean, this isn't funny. In other countries, especially other developed countries, the most elite universities are the public universities. Like Oxford is a public university. And same deal with Leiden University. It was, it was the, you know, most elite university in the Netherlands. And one of my fellow students there, I mean, I never actually talked to him, but I would see him around, was the crown prince. And um, it was just hilarious to me that, I'm, it was, it's more funny if you knew my grandparents, who they were peasants, and, um, and just the idea, that was just, kind of the culmination of the American Revolution because the whole idea that all men are created equal, what that meant is uh, it was a denunciation of monarchy, right? And so I am this kid from Montana paying Montana in-state tuition to go to school with the crown prince who has since changed his name to King of the Netherlands <laughs> and I mean, sometimes I would be like locking up my bike next to him or go, you know, I was checking books out of the same library and his ancestor, William of Orange, had founded the school and kind of the country. And just the idea that, you know, I was this hick going to school with this prince was enormously satisfying and um, amusing to me. If I may. Yes. Can I quote? two parts from your book and then we will finish with that. If you must. And I think this is very valuable for our freshmen. Okay. You say, freedom of expression truly exists only when a society's most repugnant nitwits are allowed to spew their nonsense in public. Tell us about the importance of freedom of speech. So. I mean, you either believe in it or you don't. Um, it, and it, you have to be tough. I mean, there's a lot of hateful, terrible, violent speech in the world. But I mean, Washington, there's this beautiful letter Washington sends to Lafayette that um, that event with the French Navy you're referring to, Lafayette takes it really hard how upset the American people are with the French. He's taking it personally. And he writes Washington a letter like, why is everyone being so mean to my people? And Washington tells him, um, we're founding a republic. And in a free republic, people will speak without thinking. And that's what we're fighting for here. You know, They have to be free enough to say what's on their minds, even if they're wrong. And I mean, the, I guess the bright side is sometimes that means people who have something to say get to say it. Yeah. Lastly, there's a moment in the book when you say that to me is the quintessential experience of living in the United States, constantly worrying whether or not the country is about to fall apart. And then you say, this unity is the through line in the national plot, not necessarily as a failing, but as a free people's privilege. That's right, because I mean, it's chaotic and it's messy and sometimes it's really mean-spirited and dispiriting. And um, I mean, one thing I think the students at this university by getting to know one another, they could maybe cut down on some of the um, meanness a little bit by seeing each other's humanity. But um, like back to my friends, the Tibetans, you know, when when they when they speak up against the Chinese government, they can go to prison for 
what is it, what is it called, splitism. In, in China, you can go to jail for splitism because you're, you know, you're making trouble. You're not part of the national narrative. And in America, splitism is the rule, you know, because you have that freedom. You don't have to always agree to agree. You can have your own thoughts and beliefs and, and, um, and people are going to fight and they're going to argue and there's, you know, it's not always pretty. It hardly ever is, <laughs> but better that than the alternative, you know? Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, President. And that is Sarah Vowell, the author of Lafayette and the Somewhat United States, our convocation speaker, our alumna. Uh, Sarah has offered a very generous opportunity for the MSU students to benefit from this opportunity and she will be interacting with our freshman class throughout the entire semester. So it's the first time that we will have an elongated convocation. Thank you so much oh, for joining us. My pleasure. Go Cats. <laughs> what a great conversation. Thank you, President Cruzado and Sarah Vell. Thank you, class of 2024, MSU, and the Bozeman community for joining us tonight. To the class of 2024, I wish you luck on your journey. There are many people rooting for you and so many that are willing to help. Have a good night, stay safe, and go Cats.